This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. You are the leader in the courtroom, and you want the jury to be looking to you for the answers. When you figure out your theory, never deviate. You want the facts to be consistent, complete, and credible. The defense has no problem running out the clock. Delay is the friend of the defense. It's tough to grow a firm by trying to hold on and micromanage. You've got to front load a simple structure for jurors to be able to hold on to. What types of creative things can we do as lawyers, even though we don't have a trial setting? Whatever you've got to do to make it real, you've got to do to make it real. But the person who needs convincing is you. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation, your source to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your law firm. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Welcome to today's Trial Lawyer Nation. Today, we have a lawyer from Houston, Texas, Anthony Vessel. Anthony's with Mark Whitehead & Associates, where he's a partner, and he's going to talk to us a lot about how to manage a law firm because they have a heck of an operation going on over there. Anthony, how are you doing today? Hey, doing good, Michael. How are you? I'm doing great. Before I dive in and start talking about your story, I just want to say thank you to our sponsor, Law Pods. Law Pods is the company that produces our podcast. They make it super easy. All you and I have to do is talk. Uh, They did all the setup before, and then they will do all the editing and production afterwards and even and put out our little clips and graphics that we're going to put on social media to get people to listen to this. So if you're thinking about doing a podcast, I highly recommend Law Pods. Now that I've paid the bills, let's go talk a little bit about you. So can you introduce yourself to us? Yeah, I'm Anthony Vessel. I'm a partner at Mark Whitehead & Associates, as you mentioned, Michael. I'm also a mediator, but I run our social security disability section of our firm. Our I've been with Mark and this law firm for about uh, 12 years now. And um, this is this is what we do. We do disability law. We help Social Security disability claimants uh, get their, their benefits. We help uh, veterans get their disability benefits and workers get their disability insurance through those carriers. That's an important area of law, but that's got to be a challenging business to run because even more so than PI, I mean, you're going to have long waits to get paid. And then, frankly, you know, you're your fee for case is not, you don't have like your million dollar fees like you can get PI. Yeah, and you hit the nail on the head, Michael. It's um, it's a high volume firm. We're very dependent on good team members. And that's honestly what I thought I could help bring to your listeners in this podcast today is the management side of law firms. Because I'm sure you've had tremendous trial, I know you've had tremendous trial lawyers, I've heard them on your podcast that can tell you how to win a trial and all the great things they do. But my partner, Mark, often says, you know, they're, they're, you can be a great lawyer, but to run a law office takes a different type of skill set. And a lot of great lawyers aren't necessarily great business people or law office managers. And so that's where I think I can help out. That's absolutely true. I've had years where we've had lots of successes, brought in lots of money, but somehow there's none left for me at the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's not any fun. I've been working real hard on being a, a better owner and manager since then. I found that I used to think there was a conflict between being a good lawyer and a good manager. And now I'm, I've learned over the years that if you have a firm that's run well, then you're not always having to panic and deal with crises and you can actually have the time to be a good lawyer. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. You know, there's a lot of those cliches like work harder. I mean, work smarter, not harder and things like that that apply, but it's really using your resources, really investing in your team. So it's going to, what I say today is maybe going to sound corny or sound like, you know, kumbaya around the fire kind of stuff, but it really works. There's statistical backing on a lot of the stuff I'm going to pull from today and tell you all about it. So excited to to talk about that. And I love y'all's operation. Actually, Mark's been on the podcast before. He's someone I respect a lot and and I'm Really looking forward to hearing from you and the, you know, what you've learned about running that, that firm. So let's, I want to talk a little bit, just to put things in perspective, a little bit about the firm. So we know what kind of, how, what kind of law you do, but how big are you? How many cases are you all handling? Yeah, so for my department, I have just shy of 2,000. Um, I have the biggest department in terms of cases. We have, however you decide to count them, we have between six and eight lawyers at our firm. And then our total staffing is around 60, 65, again, depending on how you want to count them with like part-time folks, stuff like that. And so 2,000 cases, the whole firm or just your part? 
that's just my department. Uh, I believe probably total closer to 3,000, 3,500, 3, give or take. And uh, it, again, there there's some qualifiers there. So I'm just, I'm taking a hack at it. No, that's fine. So how do you run that many cases? And I know you have to, because you, you, know, you can't just say, like PI can just say, well, we're just going to do really big cases and have a small caseload per lawyer. You'd go broke in Social Security if you want to have 20 or 30 cases per lawyer. So how do you... How do you give clients quality representation when you have that many cases? Really good intake staff. And you know, one thing that we're talking about, our, our firm likes to call folks team, team members. So I, I will slip and say staff here and there, but we want everyone to feel like a part of the team. They are part of the team. So we're really trying to get in the habit of saying that. Creating a really good team, especially at intake, really, really strict intake standards, uh, trainings and retrainings making sure everyone's on the same page of this is a good case. This is the type of case we can win. This is the type of case we can really help out with. And we're enthusiastic to help out with and avoiding the stuff that we really, you know, that's not really in our wheelhouse that, that we don't think we can help out with. Um, avoiding those 80, 20 clients. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Those yeah. guys that are, yeah. People that take up a disproportionate amount of your time and energy and give you very little in return. That's right. Yeah, that we all we all end up with something no matter how hard we try. I want to take a step back then and you said that you know you've really worked one of the keys to success has been working on intake to figure out that you're only taking the kind of cases where you can that you want that you can do some good on. How did you all figure out what does that case look like? A lot of it is uh education and go you know we we really invest a lot in going to conferences. I go to a the NOSCAR conference, which is a national conference for social security representatives. And so you sit through some of those CLEs and you, you start to learn like, what are these cases? What are the percentage cases that are winning? And, and just your knowledge of the law leads you that way. You, you're, you look back at the cases that you win and you're like, oh yeah, I keep winning these over 50. I mean, that's, that's, there are these certain set of rules. And I don't want to go down a rabbit trail, but called the grid rules. And basically if you're over 50, you have a favorable treatment by social security and especially over 50 with a more physical uh, nature to your work. If you're doing air quotes, blue collar work, um, people, it's, it's easier to prove that that person can't go back and do that job when they have a bad back or a bad shoulder or something like that, rather than trying to prove someone who can't, can't do a desk job. That's a little bit harder to prove. Yeah. yeah. And I guess that would be so important, you know, given that you're not going to be able to make that much per case. So you would take a bunch of bad cases that could really kill your average fee per case. Yeah, it can. It can take it. And, you know, it's about your time and effort that you're plugging into your cases. You want to put all your time and effort into cases that you know you can win and cases you know you can help folks out on because we're a good law firm. We do good work. And, you know, but we do have a finite amount of resources and, and manpower and time and money. And so we want to help as many people as we can. And um, so therefore, we have to select those cases we know that we can help out on. We know we can win. And um, and I have referred uh, disability cases to your firm before, just, you know, full disclosure. But just so I can know what to send over. I mean, you, so you like blue, blue collar jobs, physical jobs, over 50, any other characteristics that make a better claim? Absolutely. And greatly appreciate it, Michael. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> those are good cases for Social Security for a long-term disability insurance cases, that that would be more towards, again, air quotes, but white collar jobs. Your folks who are more professionals, they generally have better policies and they generally have better access to medical treatment in, in most regards. And that's, that's the body of evidence that we're pulling from. Almost 95% of your evidence is your medical treatment. So unfortunately, and it's, it's a broken, it's a broken cycle in our country, and I'll, I'll, I'll avoid going down that rabbit trail as well, but your access to medical care really is a, is a big factor on your ability to obtain your disability benefits, either Social Security or disability insurance. Uh, we also represent veterans, and most veterans who qualify uh, would have access to TRICARE, have access to the VA medical treatment. So it's not as big of a factor for our vets because they generally can get access to medical care through the VA. But yeah, veterans and, and Mark often does this presentation and we all have actually 
called Mike the Mechanic, where we have what's called a triple threat client, where it's someone who has access to all three, a veteran who has access to social security disability benefits and also access to disability insurance benefits through their work or through uh, private uh, private access. So, And then you can make all three claims. That's right. All It's three different cases with the same client. Oh, that's great. Especially, like I said, when you're dealing with a, a limited, what's the max fee in social security disability? They just raised it. Congress is very generous and uh, it's 7,200. And I say that sarcastically because it yeah. was set at 6,000 uh, about 12 years ago. So they raised it $100 per year. And so us, us social security representatives have been a little salty about it, but we are happy for the increase. And you know, it, it does go towards the clients getting better representation. A lot of folks have had to shut down shop because they're just, the margins are so thin. Yeah. It's uh, 7,200 now. So, you know, intake's really important for all of us because even on the bigger cases, you can spend a lot of time and money on a case that turns out not to be so good. But I imagine that even once you get the case in, you need to be pretty efficient. How do you make sure you're, when you're handling that many cases that, you know, you're, you're doing the things that need to be done, you're giving good customer service, and you're, you know, most importantly, meeting all the deadlines? It's a few fold there. That's a loaded question. And uh, one aspect of it is how you organize your your team. So we've reorganized my team a few times, but how it's set up now, um, I've got them set up into pods. So we have intake. Intake does your sign up. They send you all the paperwork, give you the welcome packet, all that good stuff. Then it gets passed over to what I call pod one on my team. Uh, pod one, they do the initial application. And then if that gets denied, uh, a reconsideration and a request for reconsideration. And so those are folks that are highly organized, that are great people, yeah. great, on the, great on the phone, great with clients, and folks that have a high attention to detail. And then uh, this is assuming a denial all the way because it, that's the five-step sequential process. And then it's also uh, five steps in the social security process, oddly enough. But um, after that reconsideration denial, uh, then you go to an ALJ hearing, administrative law judge hearing, and that's whenever an attorney accompanies the uh, claimant and argues the case before an administrative law judge. And so at that point, it goes to pod two. So pod two, um, they're my more analytical people. They help us dig through the file, find key pieces of evidence, follow up with the clients, make sure that we've requested all their medical evidence and set up all the, the prep calls, all that good stuff with the attorney and the client. You know, all the all the I's dotted, T's crossed. Uh, so you look really good going to those hearings. What kind of systems do you use to make sure all those things happen? Our case management system is Litify. And so that does a really good job of setting tasks. Litify has been good for such a high volume practice like ours. It's funny, Michael, uh, I was listening to your, your episode with Mark um, a few weeks ago, just uh, when you and I were talking about doing this episode and, and he was talking about how it's great for a high volume practice perhaps maybe not ideal for someone with a smaller volume practice. Um, but we've had pretty good results with it. We like it and uh, it's it's really customizable and you're able to tailor it to your needs and with it being cloud-based, you know, everyone's got work from home type options at their firm these days. And so that makes it easier to, you don't have to have it loaded up on your laptop or anything like that. You can access it through the web. And do you have I guess besides the computer system, any systems in place where someone's double checking to make the sure that other people are actually doing the steps? Absolutely, and that that's the second part. So it's um, training and retraining. It's clear policies and procedures, and part of what it's a culture really, and that's that's something that's really changed the game for our 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 firm when I started here about 12 years ago, we, we didn't have a clear culture. We didn't have a great system in place for, for onboarding employees and, and getting them trained up and, and that kind of thing. You know, and then we started to work on that. We started to do a lot more, well, we call it now attorney book club, where quarterly uh, all the attorneys at the firm are assigned a book. We have to read it and we have to give a presentation to the other attorneys at the firm. And so a lot of that goes to the culture we want to create within our firm. It's also right people, right seats. That's pulled from Traction, Gino Wickman's book, Traction. Uh, he says, right people, right seats. You might have hired a dynamite person, a really good candidate, and then you find that that person's just not ideal in the spot that you put them in. 
I had a person on my team who was hired for our VA department and she wasn't quite doing great there. She was kind of struggling from what I understood. But then um, we offered her a move over to my team and she's knocking it out of the park, doing a really great job. I, I hardly hear a complaint from clients from her and I hear nothing but good things or tasks. You know, I've, uh, Litify gives you access to different folks' task lists so I can go through and check on my team, see how they're doing, task completion, timeliness, how long is their task list because it's a running total. She's killing it, doing a great job. So right people, right seats. Well, I want to step back then to, let's go back 12 years. When you're, so you're out of law school, uh, if your law school is anything like mine, you don't get taught much about how to run a law firm while you're in law school. And you said that, you know, you didn't have a consistent culture. You didn't have great, necessarily great training. What were the results of that? What, what were the problems you, you were seeing? Well, and it's a great question, Michael, because there's like this evolution when you're trying to develop this culture. And a lot of these books, they echo one another or they're, you know, the Venn diagram, they're, they share about 60%. Maybe they're just a little bit different uh, hanging off the side there. But a lot of them force you to be introspective. And so 12 years ago, I was like, man, I hired this lady and man, she just wasn't good. Or man, I hired this lady and she just, this guy, he couldn't get it done. And you, you've got to turn inward and say, what am I? Am, I'm the one training everyone. I'm the one who's hiring yep. everyone. What's the common denominator? Yours truly. It's me. It's Absolutely. us. And so you've got to turn inward. And um, it's funny because we at the, it's not funny that we were having to to go through so many people, but Mark gave me the, the dubious nickname, Tony the Hatchet Man, which was because I had to fire so many people. I had so many people leave and I hated that. I thought it was... Yeah not it's not fun that's the worst day of my of my career was the first time i had to fire someone and uh so we said what you know what do we have to do to to change this stuff and you know part of what we're looking at were you know the culture of finding what one thing we were doing wrong was we tried to find people that had a certain skill set that uh -huh did things exactly as we we would want them to do or have the training or, or you know, uh, work history that we were looking for. But we're in, as you probably know, a very niche area of the law. And there just isn't a lot of the specific work background for, for what we do that just not out there in the hiring pool. So what we really changed was we need to find someone that fits our team and fits our culture. And so one of the key things that we're looking for now is empathy. We look for people with strong senses of empathy because we are dealing with very marginalized folks. We're dealing with people who are down and out, going through it, mentally having issues, mentally having issues due to their disability or due to the medications they're on, their financial stress, et cetera. The, the list goes on, uh, access to healthcare. We have to find people that can deal with that and people that are not only can deal with it, want to deal with that. So that's one of our, our big areas of questioning when we're interviewing folks is, do they have a deep sense of empathy? And that goes back to creating the culture that you want. We want to be around empathetic people. I don't want to be around people that make fun of my clients. That irritates me. Uh, that's, yeah. not, that's just not good for the culture. But we have people, and my, my team's right out there, and I hear them on the phone all the time, and they're patient, they're empathetic people that and that, that's that's one of the core values. And, that, and that's also part of what we do in our team meet. We have monthly all staff meetings where we repeat our core values every single time because we want everyone to know how very important they are. If you'd like me to to tell you them. Yeah, I, I was going to yeah. ask you, I've got a yeah. couple of questions there. Yeah. So sure. first of all, just because it's right there. Yeah, and yeah. I also start every meeting with our purpose and our core values and our yeah. strategies for success. So what are your core values there at Mike Whitehead and Associates? Yeah, absolutely. Integrity, accountability, compassion, communication, teamwork, customer service, health and happiness in the workplace. And how did you come up with your core values? Mark and the other attorneys sat around in a meeting and, and thought about what was really important. And we kind of chiseled out, you know, we had a list of a really long list and chiseled them down into the those those unique i believe they're eight <laughs> yeah yeah a lot any any book or consultant or anything you use to on the core values exercise um well there are a lot of books that you know there's uh, patrick lencioni's uh five dysfunctions of a team 
Yeah, that, but Patrick only lets you have three core values if you read all his books. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's Patrick why I was can, asking. <laughs> yeah. He, but but I mean, traction lets you have more. <laughs> so, that's that's right. That's we're, right. And traction's we're, a great one. I, I, I'm going to go at, talk a little bit about each of those books in a little more detail, so catch, catch up with the listener. But I was just wondering whether you just like you'd read a bunch of stuff and you just came up with the exercise or you're like following this kind of the script or the step-by-step -step process from one particular book. And, you know, I... I don't mean to give you a, a, a contrived answer, but it, it's really right. what's important to you, you know? Yeah. And, and you, yeah, they, these guys, they're brilliant. They're brilliant business uh, book writers, of course, but uh, you know, it all boils down to you at the end of the day. I mean, if, if Mr. Lencioni says I can only have three, well, I, I'm running my own law firm. I'm going to have eight at my law firm because they're all eight yeah. very important to us. I will, I will say for me, I know that each one, you don't necessarily have to do them in this order, but different books have been an evolutionary process. Like if I hadn't read e myth Revisited by Michael Gerber, I would have never thought to have written step-by-step -step procedures on how to do things. Yeah. Uh, if I if I hadn't read The Four Disciplines of Execution, I would have never learned how to get someone to do what is in my systems that were written down. If I hadn't read the Lincioni books, I wouldn't have known the importance of developing a, a team based on you know, shared values and on vulnerability based trust where we all can speak, you know, to each other clearly and have robust debate without it being an attack on each other. Uh, if I hadn't read Traction by Gina Wickman, I wouldn't realize there's another level my business used to get to and that I can't get there alone. I need what's called an integrator. I need someone else that's good at running the business so I can be the visionary and come up with the ideas. You know, just, but you, you kind of have to get to it at the right time in your career, if that makes any sense, and, and kind of build. That's you hit the nail on the head there, Michael, because it's you have to be open. And it, again, I'm going to say some kumbaya stuff today, I'm sure. But um, you have to have an open heart and an open mind to really absorb some of these key principles. I, I remember when we first started doing our, our attorney book club, as we call it, I was like, oh, great, Mark. Yeah, because I've just got this abundance of time to go home and read. Yeah yet another book. I don't have all these cases to take care of and all these other personal things. So our first few books, you know, I pouted and had my arms crossed, you know, but that's, you don't, you don't grow that way. And so one of my favorite books that we read this year uh, was actually my colleague, uh, Selena Valdez recommended was uh, Leaders Eat Last. Have you read that one, Michael? Okay. N not yet. I'm going to add it to the, it's, uh, add to by, the list. tell me about that one. Yeah. Yeah. And it's over on my, my bookshelf over there. Simon Sinek. I hope I'm pronouncing his name okay. correctly. Yeah. And yes, you are. He's uh, I know my chief galvanizing officer is really into Simon Sinek. So that book, not only was it a good personal professional development book, very, very interesting uh, anecdotes to support the to support the principles. Have you ever read the and I'm going to go back to it, I promise, but the key negotiators book uh, never split the difference. Care. I have it on my, it was given to me two weeks ago. Uh, I have it at home. I'm going to fly to Paris on two days and I'm going to read it on the trip. I did hear uh, one of, what was her name? One of the people that works for that company uh, that yeah. publishes the book uh, was a keynote lecturer at, a, at an event I was in. And so I heard a lot about the concepts in there, but so yeah, and I, you know, like I mentioned, I'm a mediator. I do a lot of mediations as an advocate for my clients. So this negotiation book was very interesting to me. But one of the reasons I really enjoyed this book was because the author, and I'm, I'm blanking on his name, but he would give a very compelling, very interesting real life story and then tie it into the theme of that chapter, tie it into the lesson of that chapter. Well, Simon does the same thing in Leaders Eat Last. It starts off the very first chapter is a, a, a death-defying World War, or I'm not sure which war actually, but a, a pilot mission where, you know, he's got like a, you know, a, a Top Gun kind of percentage chance. I forget that most recent Top Gun movie, but he just keeps doing these sweeping raids and his chance of being shot down is exponential. He's just really going all out for his team, but he's the leader. And that's that was kind of the takeaway from that chapter is, you do what you have to do because you're the leader and you inspire your team by doing that. And that that one chapter is just one of many that are very, very fascinating stories and anecdotes that support the lesson. Uh, but another one from that book was a guy walking into a, into a factory where everything's backwards uh, in terms of 
employee culture and satis- workplace satisfaction. You have to punch out to go use the bathroom, you know, all these yeah. archaic kind of old school stuff. And he comes in and, and tells the story of a guy walking in and be like, nope, that scrap that. Nope, you can eat lunch as long as you need to. You know, you don't always punch out to go make a phone call. If you have a sick kid, you have to punch out to go call to whatever, all that stuff. Comes in, makes the place a more palatable place to work. And there are production rates. He's a guy, he was a statistician and all the production rates just shot up. All the sat- yeah. employee satisfaction, employee retention, everything through the roof. And so, you know, I've, I've worked and I feel like I've gotten way far away from your question, Michael. So I'll, no, it's uh, great. I love it. Keep going. <laughs> okay. So I grew up in Beaumont, Texas. Uh, I'm the first lawyer in my family. I'm the first male in my family to ever go to college. Uh, as you can imagine, I've, I've worked every single job you can imagine. Uh, yeah. I've, I've worked as a butcher's assistant. I've worked in a motorcycle warehouse. I've worked retail delivery, all sorts of stuff before I went to college and law school. And, um, I've thought about these different jobs and and different bosses, more importantly, that I've had over the years. And I'd invite the listeners, you know, right now, just pause for a moment and think of your favorite boss. Just think of your favorite or best boss of your opinion. Think of them. And then now name three qualities that you think make them the best boss that you've ever had. Now let's do let's flip that exercise on on its head. Think of the worst boss that you've ever had. Just take a few moments. Think of the worst boss that you've ever had. Now same thing. Three qualities. What made them the worst boss? And so, when you're trying to become a good leader, yeah, this, this is kind of supported by this book uh, by Gino, uh, no, Gino Whitman. Sorry, Simon Sinek's book. Simon Sinek. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's that. It's really trying to be a person that inspires others, that uh, someone that's easy to work with and work for. And as kind of the title of the book, Leaders Eat Last, you don't ask anybody to do something that you feel you're above um, or that you, you wouldn't find it appropriate for you to do yourself. Now, obviously, roles and, and how you, what part you play in the firm, that's going to differ. But the whole premise behind that book is that the culture is driven by the leader. If you're asking everyone to show up, be prepared, know what they're doing that day, and then you show up with your pants down, well, how how are you inspiring your employees? You know, your actions always speak louder than words. And so they're looking at you. They're always looking at you. So you have to show up prepared and you you have to lead folks by example. And uh, a lot of that going back to culture and core values, you have to embody those core values. You know, if I'm not showing accountability or if I'm not showing compassion, how can I ask my team to do that? They're not going to do it unless they're just incredibly driven, you know? So you say culture. What do you mean by culture? Oh, that's an easy one, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it is an easy one. It's Look, we, we all spend, especially as lawyers, we spend more time at work than we do at home or with our friends or in our favorite hobbies for the, for the most part. And so culture to me is creating the, the, the type of place that, that, you want to be in and also creating a place that is inclusive of others and that, you know, rewards good behavior, um, rewards those types of, uh, people that, that can best help you further your mission. And so for me, culture is building those values, building that, that environment that, like I said, supports a, a good workplace that supports a positive, healthy place to be. How would you describe the culture of your firm? I would describe the culture at our firm as always seeking improvement. Believe I don't know the exact title of the book, but the the concept is kaizen. I yeah. think yeah. So it's a Japanese business philosophy, from what I understand. I haven't read a lot about it, but what I do understand is that it's constant incremental improvement yields great great results. So if you can improve one yeah, percent get- each year, three percent each year. You know, that's better than just a a windfall of 50% and then you backslide 25% next year or something like that. It's um, constantly seeking improvement. And so Diana, our integrator, uh, using the the OS uh, term, our our COO, she is, uh, there's that that old book, uh, Who Moved My Cheese? She's said, you know, just here you're going to expect to constantly have your cheese moved. Uh, You need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, because we're always going to be changing things up. We're always going to be seeking improvement. But 
there's that side of our culture, but the other side of our culture is we like people to be comfortable here. We don't have a super strict dress code. We're not super strict on if you know everyone needs to be here bright eyed and bushy tailed at eight o'clock in the morning. If you're, you know, if you're for my team personally, if you're if you're caught up on your tasks, if your clients are happy, um, if you're not, you know, getting negative comments from clients and that sort of thing, if you're helping support the attorneys do the best they can at court and that sort of thing, then I don't really care much about when you get in or when you leave or what clothes you're wearing. Of course, if we have a client coming in, we want you to look good. But but if you're wearing, you know, if you know you don't have any meetings set that day and you want to come in in jeans and a sweatshirt or something, um, I got bigger fish to fry. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and commercial vehicle cases. If you have an injury case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us by calling 210-941-1301 to discuss the case in detail and see where we can add value in a partnership. And now, back to the show. So, Anthony, you talked a lot about firm culture and what kind of culture you've built. Did that just happen naturally or what have you done to build the team culture you want? Yeah. So we try to be very intentional about number one, making our place, our, our workplace, the type of place that people want to be. That helps us attract the people that, that we find bring us success. Uh, so there are little things that we do, but I think that they carry value. We have our all staff meeting where that's monthly. We give everyone kind of the updates for the month. We give everyone the uh, information they need, but we also do things to, to build the team up. So we um, have the new member greetings. Any, anyone that we've hired in the last uh, month, we have them introduce themselves or we introduce them as managers. Um, we do a birthday shout out or we follow up with cupcakes afterwards. We have work anniversary shout outs. That's always really fun where uh, someone who's been there a year to date, their uh, manager, or managing attorney, will say about 30 seconds, a minute of nice things about them and how they add to the team. We do incentives for positive reviews. If we have team members that get their, get personally mentioned in a, in a positive internet review from a client, uh, we read that in the meeting and also we give them a gift card uh, for, for going and getting that review. We also do... Uh, for like our, our health and happiness core value. We do a stipend for gym memberships. We want people to feel healthy and uh, have access to, to uh, a healthy lifestyle. And um, I'd say another thing that we do is um, more granularly on, granularly on my team, I do huddles, a huddle meeting every Monday and Wednesday. And so I give my team access to me at least four out of the five days of a week. Uh, there's the open door policy that's everyone thinks to be a good manager, you have to have an open door policy, but that flies in the face of time blocking, which is really important in our firm. If you let people come in and interrupt you all the time, they shall. And then you won't have any time to focus on the big things you've got to get accomplished as a lawyer or as anybody, in, as a, any professional. So Mondays and Wednesdays, 30 minutes after our firm opens, we have a standing huddle I aim for it to be between 10 and 20 minutes, 15 is ideal. And in that, we everyone goes over their task numbers, uh, what, what their challenges are for the week that they foresee, their attendance for the week. So everyone knows like, oh, if I need to meet with Miguel, Miguel's going to be out on Wednesday or, you know, I need to meet with him earlier, things like that. Um, and then if anyone has a specific problem that doesn't apply to the whole group, then I'll hang back with them and we'll go over it together. Or someone else on the team that's experienced that issue before will hang back with them. So we don't have this this big you know, group chat in the meeting. We can stay focused and, and move through all the stuff we've got to hit while not interrupting others. And then we also, I, I found that it's fun. We, we add jokes. Um, everyone, uh, we always invite for anyone to, to tell a joke, but I've got Mark got me this corny dad joke book. Uh, and so I like to end the meeting with a joke. You know, it's 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 Monday. Nobody wants to be there. It's cold outside. We had to go through an hour's worth of Houston traffic. So just to kind of jump off on a lighter note. And then I have a team member who does affirmations. He's got a little card deck of daily affirmations. And uh, so nice. he'll read that. But it's just, it kind of breaks up the 
robotic nature that work meetings can have. And uh, we also do team uh, team lunches monthly uh, where I, I take my team to lunch and the rule is no work talk. Um, it's just oh, good. to get to know each other. I, I make it a goal. I know all the attorneys make it a goal to eat lunch or have a coffee in the break room with everybody at least one, a few times a month. I try to do once a week. Calendar doesn't always allow for that, but we, we do our best. And then you were mentioning, uh, Michael, the four disciplines of execution, WIGs, uh, wildly important goals. So clearly published scoreboards and clearly published wildly important goals. So one or two of those per pod, you know, and I, I failed to yeah. mention earlier, my medical records team, they're the backbone of our team. Uh, but in our pods, I've got pod one, pod two, intake, and medical records. But yeah, so everyone's got their own goals that that help contribute to the team. And then uh, your expectations and policies have to be clearly published. And uh, oh, I was talking about I was talking about office hour, or I was talking about open door policy. My answer to that are these huddles. But then um, also on Tuesdays, I've got an hour of office hours. So doors open. That's usually when I eat my lunch. If you've got an issue, you know, come on, come on in. You don't, you don't even have to knock or anything. Just coming in. If you want to talk about the Astros, obviously, I'm always thrilled to talk about the Astros or whatever you want to talk about. Uh, we can talk about work or not, but it's it's open door policy. And so, I've had people come in and talk about personal problems. I've had people talk about their marriages yep. or kids or whatever, wow. and it's it's fine. Hopefully, next year we'll want to talk about the Aggies for some more. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. We both went to Texas A and M for our listeners, so the... yeah, gig them. But yeah, we also have team uh, blow off the steam events where you know go have a happy hour, go bowling, go to putt putt or top golf or whatever. Uh, it's just these little things that you would think are just insignificant or a, a money waster, but it, whenever we're trying to compete with big law downtown. And, you know, we can't pay what they pay for a paralegal salary. But what we can do is make you feel meaning, uh, help you know that you're fighting for the good guys. You're really trying to help disabled people who need it most. And, you know, we try to create a really fun, really inviting culture so people want to be here. Good. You said that, you know, you're not, and I agree with you, you know, trying to hire people for the skills, even if someone knows how to do the job, they know how to do it in another firm, not your way and not necessarily your culture. And you said that empathy is something you're really looking for. How did you figure out, you know, what what are you looking for in an employee? That's a great question. It's, um, you know, there's soft skills and hard skills, right? And um, having people come in that are really a blank slate and that can learn quickly, people that seem interested in what we do. And we've had a lot of our uh, team members that have come in and had the greatest success are people that either have suffered an illness or suffered a disability or have had a family member who or, or a close one, a, a close loved one who suffered an illness or a disability. Um, and in fact, one of our newest hires on my team, uh, she came from the med center. Uh, she worked, I believe, at uh, Methodist or uh, one of the hospitals, the med center, but one of the big ones as a cancer liaison. And so, I mean- oh, wow. Who has a greater skill set of empathy than someone who works with with cancer survivors and cancer fighters? And so, and she's been dynamite. She's come on and just done a great job, you know. And I'm like, if if people can take on work stress, who better than than someone like that? And so, that's that core set of skills, and and I would imagine those probably soft skills, but gives you a really good palette to work with. Do you do any kind of testing or assessments to look for these qualities? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked, Michael. We do, um, one of our biggest ones is called the DISC test, D-I-S-C. It's an acronym and it's the four values are represented by each of those letters. And it's somewhat similar to the Myers-Briggs, but it's very different in that it's not putting you in a box. It's not saying you're a this or a that, but you have different, you have a D and I and S and a C. D is a dominant personality, someone who is your your stereotypical trial lawyer. I'm this is my way. I'm driving. Get in the bus. Let's go. Um, usually, folks who like to take the reins and lead. But you know, each value has pluses and of course minuses. So D's can be unyielding. They can be a little bit difficult to work with. They can be abrasive. They can be a little maniacal sometimes, if you want to say that. But but 
they're also a great leader sometimes. They, they're they also really good at getting the job done. They'll stop at nothing to, to get what, you know, to accomplish the goal. So you need people like that on a team. High eyes, that's, that's me. A high eye is someone who uh, it stands for- An eye is influential? Influential, that's right. Sorry. And no, no, absolutely, yeah. And um, it's someone who likes working as a team. It's someone who likes working with people. If you chain me to a desk and have me write briefs all day, I might cry because I like to be around my team and work with others and uh, talk and network and that kind of thing. But there's a big problem to that. If I'm talking and networking all the time, I'm not getting work done or I can distract others. I can go walk around the office and pull someone out of focus. So there's pluses and minuses to that. S is steady. So who can you count on? Who can you come in and, and accomplish the goal every day? You know, rain, sleet, or snow, who's going to be there? That's your high S people. And your high C, that's compliance. Those are your people, your rule followers, people that are very ordinal, follow procedures, stay on task, that sort of thing. Those people can be a little bit inflexible. That would be one of their negative qualities. But, you know, I it's funny because on this disc test, I am about one rung from the top of maxing out the I category. My my S is relatively high. The D category, I'm about in the middle, a little bit above middle. And then on the C, I'm about two rungs from the lowest you can get on that. So like, don't tell me what to do. I don't want to follow procedure. I just want to run free and do what I want to do and that sort of thing. And that gets me into trouble. You know, it's it can be difficult to fight through that. But one of the other main takeaways from this test is that it's not to say that that if you're a low I, you can't go out and network. It's saying it may take you more energy than someone right. who is a natural high I. Like, in fact, there are people at our firm that are a lower I. People love them. They're great. They're great people, people. You know, um, they just, after a networking event, they're totally drained. Whereas I'm like, okay, we're next. What are we doing next? You know, because it didn't take any energy for me. Do you, do you only test new hires or do you, did you test your existing employees? We tested everyone. Everyone got tested because this helps us learn who works best with each other on the team. You know, it's not, another great thing about this test is it's it's not a pass or fail. It's not a good or a bad. It's just, a, are you a rectangle, a square, triangle? What are you? And, you know, what comes most naturally to you more so than what are you? It's it's what's easiest for you. I think it's really important to test your best people. Uh, one, because you get an idea of what kind of profiles you're looking for. But two, it gives you, you know, an idea of, of what tests are valid and what aren't. So there's one test I had someone here using in hiring. And I only wanted, like Wonderlick has an intelligence part. And I wanted the intelligence part. But then they also give you whether someone is a good personality fit and is going to have good motivation to do the job. Yeah. And we had them test our best, most long-term employees, and they told us that these people would be horrible at the job. <laughs> so we we decided that this test was not valid. And, you know, the, the intelligence part was the rest was not valid for our firm and what we were looking for. And maybe, you know, they were looking at, you know, paralegals in general or, you know, attorney medical records people in general and not at what we were looking for. Uh, but it just... You know, if, if if it tells you you're, you know, if what what it's telling you is totally different than what you're experiencing, then you know that it's not being interpreted in a way that's helpful to you. Whereas, you know, if other assessments, you know, this really rings true and we're finding like we have this commonalities in our best employees. So let's look for people that have similar results when we're hiring for that position. Yeah. And we do. We have another test that we do. I don't think we do it for every single employee um, or potential employee, but it's uh, it, it's a test that is more of a pass or fail. It does tell you if someone's going through, it gives you, yeah, there's potential risks and then there's potential, I forget the positive qualities, and but they're all rated by three. It's like a situational risk, a conditional risk, or a high risk or something like that. And so it's like this person will not show up to work. They just absolutely won't. Or this person's having a difficulty in their personal life right now. Well, yeah, if they're looking for a job, perhaps they just got fired. You know, that that, that will show up on the test too. So that test I take with a grain of salt. We, you know, if you- Which one, which one is that? So I'm not naming it because- Is that the Jay Henderson? That, okay, yeah. So I couldn't- uh, I like Jay Henderson. Okay, I've used okay. him before. I like Jay as a person. I, I've spent a lot of time on yeah. the phone with Jay. I think he's a great guy. <clears throat> I will- very respectfully say that we've had great results with this test that are spot on. We've had some great hires that his test said 
you know, probably not, or maybe not too. So I take it with a grain of salt. You look at them as a whole, but it certainly yeah. does add some color to what you're looking at and give you a little perspective. And for the, the other good, go, go ahead. Yeah. And I, w one more thing is one thing that the JS test really does a good job of, of it is it gives you some great uh, fodder for interview questions because it'll, it'll touch on these risks. And then, so that's something you can, you can hit on in your interview. And if there's a reasonable uh, answer to, to why this, this thing popped up on the test, well, there you go. And if they can't answer it, well, it gives you something to think about as well. I also think a good thing with the Jay Henderson test, it's like, if you're going to do disc, if you're going to do, we do like Colby and print at our firm, uh, it takes you a while to figure out what to do with it. Whereas Jay can give you like, this is why this is a risk for you. This is why this would be a good person for you. Yeah, it's a good way to get started in testing, I think. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, it's an interesting test nonetheless. And if it, any of our listeners are interested, we'll put a link in the show notes. I'll give Jay a free shout out. But I just Google Jay, Jay Henderson uh, assessment. I think it's like real talent hiring or something like that. That's but, it. I couldn't uh, think of it, Michael, but that's, that's it. And um, yeah, Jay's out of Florida. Great guy. Easy to work with. So I want to go and you talk about your your you guys are constantly seeking to improve. You're constantly seeking to get better. Uh, you've got your book club. What else do you do to, to try to get better? Yeah, so we do uh, a lot of coaching. Um, we do attorney to attorney coaching. Um, we do uh, we we use a company called Atticus, and so uh, each attorney here has a coach that that we do one on ones with. Um, we also coach with Mark. Mark will do, in fact, I had my coaching lunch with Mark today before this episode, because I know Mark's been a guest on your, on your podcast and I wanted to, you know, get a sense for what he thought. And, uh, he, he says, hello. <laughs> and, um, yeah, no, I love Mark. Yeah. And, but we also, I was, I did a, I was late today cause I was doing a coaching lunch with one of my employees, one of my lawyers. So <laughs> is that Atticus coaching or with one of your, no, employees? no, I just, it was just our own, our own, we call them attorney development meetings, but it's similar. Same thing, yeah, We like attorney coaching, something like that. But then also our key admins, we have a, a coaching group for them as well. And, you know, a good, a good quote from Leaders Eat Last was, the more we give of ourselves to see others succeed, the greater our value to the group and the more respect they offer us. You know, and that's kind of the essence of that book. But it's, you know, you've got to, you've got to give your time, you've got to invest your time to 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 grow people into what you, what you need and what, what will help the yep. group. And so that's where we're coming from. And, uh, our, our firm also, we're really big in some of our legal organizations, you know, at the, at the city, state and national level, HTLA, TTLA, AAJ, uh, American Association for Justice. And, you know, each one of our attorneys has gone through the TTLA lead group. And in fact, the applications open up in January. So, Look out for that on the TTLA website, but that's been a great thing because it it, it teaches uh, leadership, empathy, accountability, and development. That's the acronym, and so it's a lot of that that stuff, of Michael, of coming into the new generation of people where we're, you know, we we want to be welcoming and inclusive. We 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 yeah. want to hire people that are different from us. Um, you know, the practice of law. Uh, there are a lot of guys that look like us 50 years ago, 25 years ago, and things really have changed and, and good for the good. You know, it's good to have so much diversity in the law now in our industry and in who we hire. And it just gives you such a, a diversity of perspective and it, it helps drive that empathy and it helps make the workplace more inclusive and, and all that kind of stuff that I'm sure folks are thinking you know, kumbaya, campfire stuff again, but reading these books, it, it works. This stuff really works. Yep. It's important. And not only is it important, it's just the right thing to do. It's just, it's just good to have people that, you know, it doesn't matter what they look like or how they identify. It's like, can you do the job and can you do it well? That's all that should matter yep. when you're hiring. And so if you, when people get past that and really see that there's so much talent out there, you're, you're opening yourself up to such a great hiring pool of people. And so all this inclusive stuff, it's it's in Leaders Eat Last. It's in No Ego by Cy Wakeman. It's, it's in- I love that book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm looking at the, my microphone sitting on a stack of books. That's what I'm looking at right now. And, and you know, it's, it's in these books. It's statistically backed. It's right. It's just straight up right. Yeah. <laughs> I actually bought a copy of, 
uh, No Ego recently for everybody on my leadership team. <laughs> it's a great book. Yeah, and and so these these book club meetings that we were talking about, it's reinforcing. I mean, that's what drives the culture. We keep adding to our culture. It, it's ever growing. It's ever evolving. It started off pretty rough back in the Tony the Hatchet Man days of of where we couldn't make a good hire, or we'd make a good hire and they'd run for the hills. That was over a decade ago, of course. So I want everyone to know that 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 was a long <laughs> time ago. Now we're very proud of the firm that we have and and all the great things that I think that we're doing, um, both for our clients but also for our employees. And that's important because it, it's a cycle. And in fact, we just uh, a book that we just read was the flywheel or the flywheel effect, and it's a very short uh-huh. book, but it's great because it's it's you have to pick these things that feed each other and keep that. It's the it's like the opposite of a vicious cycle. It's yeah. the things that drive it, and then as the wheel turns, it accelerates. Yeah, they talk about that in Good to Great. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Jim Collins. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I spent I spent two days doing a flywheel for my firm. It's so simple, but it took me two days to get it right. That was our last <laughs> assignment: was read a thirty-something page book and create a flywheel. And we we have an attorney <laughs> group chat that's, uh, and we're all pulling our hair out like this is so hard, and we just have to think of like five or six things, and we can't. It's, it's so difficult, but it's you want to do it right. You want to do a quality job. Um, well, the good thing, but once you get your your fly, and a flywheel is like a set of things that kind of, if you do one, it leads to the next one happening, which it leads to constant improvement, constant growth. And, you know, it, so it takes a lot of work to figure out what those things are at your firm, what your plan is. But once you do it, then you can like rate like out of one to five where you are in each thing. And you can really see like where are the weak points in your firm? Oh, yeah. Uh, where do you need to where do you need to focus resources? It's a really great exercise. And, and you know another one, Michael. That we're, since we're kind, of, we're kind of talking about this area, but uh, what got you here won't get you there. Have you read that one? Mm-hmm. I have it. Although I took a picture of it uh, at a Chris conference, and uh, it's the reason I'm making some new hires actually, and, and having to kind of up the uh-huh. quality of people I have helping me run the firm. And and when I had everybody do that exercise earlier of thinking, you know what good qualities in your favorite manager, good, bad qualities of your least favorite manager. Um, and in that book, you spend a lot of time, um, you know, that one is one of the big themes is continuing to improve. And that's what kind of jogged yeah. my, my mind to go there. But it's also correcting bad habits. They list about 20 bad habits and you've got to pick, you know, within the book, it's interactive. You've got to pick the bad habits that you embody. And then you it, it challenges you to work on those bad habits. Um, and, and one philosophy I really like to use is uh, stoicism. I think I've got Ryan Holiday's stoicism books over there. And uh, I, I found a lot of stoic philosophy built into this book inadvertently or, or intentionally, I'm not sure. But um, one, of, one of my favorite stoic quotes is, man conquers the world by conquering himself. That's from Zeno yeah. Sidium. Um, and so you've got to work on yourself if you want to to build the place you want to be in. So I, I really, there's a lot of good stuff there too. Top five books from the book club. So my my favorite one uh, to date, uh, again, is Leader Eat, Leaders Eat Last. Not only because of the okay. content, but because of just how interesting the stories were and how illustrative they yep. were. Five Dysfunctions of a Team is great. Let's see, Four Disciplines of Execution, that's I, I'll be honest, I didn't enjoy reading that one, but it's just it works. It wasn't a fun read, yeah. but man, it was effective. It's like an instruction manual. Yeah, exactly. It's like reading an instruction <laughs> manual. That's right. Um, what got you here won't get you there uh, is a great one. Fifth one rounding it out. Did I say traction? Not yet. Okay. I'll say traction again. That one's more of an instruction manual, not very very fun to read, but Content is very good, and obviously you 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 see the value in it. So I'll, I'll end on that one. Yeah, I've, I've read traction. Traction's talk about how to get what they call the entrepreneurial on operating system, and basically how to get your firm to operate at a higher level, uh, which to me is the next step in my journey. Hopefully, uh, which includes I've learned I can run a firm of about eight to ten lawyers with a revenue of about this and about this many cases. And I've seemed to have hit my limit. So if I want to keep growing, if I want to be able to, frankly, spend more time being a lawyer and less time being a manager, I need to find somebody that has a skill set I don't. And have a dinner interview tonight. Hopefully I've found that person, but we'll find out on a future podcast episode whether it, whether she accepts the job and whether it worked out or not. I wish you the so. best of luck. I hope you find a great one. Thank you. Uh, just to close, 
I, I'm, I'm just intrigued with this book club. So you read, is it one book a quarter? Yeah. So we, we typically read one book a quarter. Um, every attorney at the firm reads it. Almost every attorney, so it's Mark, does a, uh, does a presentation on it. And um, sometimes we're assigned different chapters or different concepts, different sections, however the book's divided. But if it, or um, if it's a book like Traction, where it's applying a um, a concept that to to a business, well, we treat our own separate department as as a standalone business, and so we present as if for me, like the Social Security Disability section, I treat it as a standalone business, and I present that way. And how often does a book club meet? Quarterly, at the end of the quarter. Oh, so it's just once a quarter. So your people are on their own to have to finish it and think about it and do their assignment through the three months. That's right. Okay, that works. Yeah. So, and although uh, I've, I haven't even gotten all my lawyers to read my book that I wrote yet. <laughs> well, and I want to add on that, Michael, because there's part of it yeah. too. Um, that our process is we'll, uh, you know, we'll read it separately. We'll get the assignment. And then we put together a presentation and then we'll go off site. We'll go uh, to a restaurant somewhere that can accommodate us with a screen or something. We'll hook up a laptop and we'll eat lunch and kind of socialize a bit, then do our presentations. And then we'll order drinks to have a happy hour and just kind of kind of openly talk about it afterwards for 30 minutes. Huh. And so it kind That's of, awesome. you know, it's a nice little uh, build up and then settle down and then everyone runs free. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, going off the record. Anything else you want me to ask about? I uh, I think I got, I mean, I think I hit everything that I, I sent you. Okay. All right, good. Then I'll just <laughs> ask for your your contact info in just case anyone wants to get a hold of you. You, you don't do any kind of coaching or anything, right? You do social security. I mean. I'm, a, I'm, Mark is saying he's trying to get me into Atticus doing coaching. I'm open to coaching for sure. I'm just, I just, if you want me to pitch anything, let me know and I'll pitch it. My my mediation career, I'm trying to get that going, but I know that doesn't really apply. But um, well, you never know. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like I'd, I said, if if you want me to pitch attorney coaching, I'll pitch it. If you don't want me to, I won't. That's the that's the question. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'm open to it. That sounds fine. So, Anthony, if anyone wants to get a hold of you, just you know, either they have a, they want to get a mediation scheduled, or they got a, a disability case uh, that they want to refer over. What's the best way to find you or contact you? Yeah, please send it directly to me. I'll include my email and, and contact uh, and the information, but it's anthony at markwhitehead.com. So uh, please just- Mark with a C. Mark with a C, that's right. Anthony, uh, my first name, A-N-T-H-O-N-Y, at symbol mark, M-A-R-C, whitehead.com. And um, yeah, I also have a website, uh, vesselmediation.com, but I, you can go ahead and email me directly and that that's probably easier for right now. And you know, those of us who are trying to run a law firm, it, it is so hard to find someone that's really, that's really been there uh, to really coach us. Are you open to doing coaching? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I've been building that up. I also, you know, if if you don't want to get an official coach, ha, you know, is there a lawyer out there that you look up to or someone you heard speak at a CLE? Reach out. I mean, I'm going to name drop Jim Perdue. Uh, I, I went to a uh, TTLA event, uh, the trial lawyer college, and he was a teacher there. I was going through a pretty rough time in my life and he pulled me aside and, and, you know, really, uh, reached out whenever I was going through a rough spot in my, in my life. And we still stay oh, in contact today. He's mentored me. And so now he's encouraged me to do the same for others. And so I encourage all of you, if there's someone you admire, um, reach out to them. You know, we're all, we're all at a different stage in our life, but also, you know, do the same for someone else. If you see another uh, brother or sister struggling, reach out and help them out because we got a short time on this Absolutely. earth. We can all use a helping hand. But as far as, you know, paid coaching, that's something you're you're, you're I'm getting into now too. very right? open to that. I'd happy to get get that set up. So yeah, give me, a, give me a call, shoot me an email. Very happy to help. Sounds great. Well, thank you for coming on today on Trial Law Nation. Uh, also ask everyone, mark your calendars. Uh, we have this year's, Big Rig Boot Camp, the seminar I do every year. It's already opened up at bigrigbootcamp.com for registration. We're going to be doing it on uh, Friday, July 12th here in San Antonio, Texas. We're going to put on a great program. I really encourage people to sign up. It's a very minimal cost, uh, and we try to put on a good show. I'm excited. Thank you for joining us today on Trial Lawyer Nation. Look forward to talking to you again on our next episode. Thank you for joining us on Trial Lawyer Nation. I hope you enjoyed our show. If you'd like to receive updates 
insider information, and more from Trial Lawyer Nation, sign up for our mailing list at triallawyernation.com. You can also visit our episodes page on the website for show notes and direct links to any resources in this or any past episode. To help more attorneys find our podcast, please like, share, and subscribe to our podcast on any of our social media outlets. If you'd like access to exclusive, plaintiff lawyer-only content and live monthly discussions with me, send a request to join the Trial Lawyer Nation Insider Circle Facebook group. Thanks again for tuning in. I look forward to having you with us next time on Trial Lawyer Nation. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and commercial vehicle cases. If you have an injury case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us by calling 210-941-1301 to discuss the case in detail and see where we can add value in a partnership. This podcast has been hosted by Michael Cowan and is not intended to nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our host, guest, and any listener for any reason. Content from the podcast is not to be interpreted as legal advice. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are only those from which they came.